So, I put this up on the website yesterday, so I thought I'd just quickly show it in the class. So, this is exactly how the prizes for the whole league on poker stars will work. I don't know how many of you guys care about this. Um, I, I posted it on the website, so this is what the prizes are. So, so yeah, so this is the list. Uh, in terms of specific details, you know, who is Cole South, who is Tom Marchese, etc. Um, I posted links to most of these people's Wikipedia pages on the website, or you can just Google, it shouldn't be hard to find. Um, yeah, so the coaching is like a virtual coaching where these pros, they usually run this service where they'll either watch you play for an hour or let you watch them play for an hour. And like, you know, they'll talk to you one on one. They can either watch you play and figure out your leaks, figure out the places where they don't think they're making the best decisions, or you can watch them play and they'll explain the thought processes very clearly. Uh, the card runner subscriptions are the, so this is a poker training website where pros, including myself, will like make videos of ourselves playing and talking at the same time. So a subscription means you get access to the entire database of over 2,000 videos or whatever the length of time is. And then there's the signed items, which is there's books, there's DVDs, they're all signed by the original author, who, authors who were kind enough to donate these prizes to the class. So are there any questions of what these prizes are? Okay, so I hope you guys are excited about them. Um, most of them are pretty high, highly being pros, pretty good prizes. Um, so the rules will be, there's 24 prizes in total in the above <coughs> lists. So how it'll work is, the top 20 in points will get prizes. The first place will get two prizes, and players can choose prizes in descending rank. And the first place, first to pick, can choose two prizes from the same category. So, you know, they can't pick like a six months card or subscription plus a four month subscription. Or, like, they can't take like the signed indie block DVD and the signed little chain book. You have to pick from two different categories. Um, and then. So after that, that's, that's 21 prizes given out. The remaining three prizes will be given to the three players with the highest points per game who have not already received a prize. Um, and you're only eligible for the average points per game prizes if you've played at least 10 games and haven't already received a prize. So, right, so there's going to be additional tournaments this week, and tournaments will end officially on the night of the day before the last class. And so prizes will be handed out on the last class. And so I hope you can be there. If you're not going to be here, um, you can either consider donating your prize to the next person or telling me what you want, and I'll try to get what you want for you. Because on the last class, everyone's going to come, and then I'm going to say, first place, come up, pick your two prizes, then the next person, pick your prizes. So um, if, you, if you're going to win a prize, which you should know by the night of the day before, you should come to class sort of prepared of what you want. Like, I don't want people spending five minutes picking their prize. Um, and as far as coaching, the in-person coaching with Mike and myself, that's going to happen either Wednesday or Thursday this week. We're going to have a special tournament where the person who knocks us out of the tournament gets the hour coaching from us. So that'll happen sometime this week, and this will be in-person coaching. So either we can meet somewhere on campus or whatever, and we can watch you play and give you coaching. So, so are there any questions about the prizes? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I hope you are excited. So next class, Mike is going to come down, and Mike is going to teach the next class. And then the last class, we'll, we'll sort of be up here together, and we'll just talk about prizes, and also talk about a few important things in the last class. So, a few, a few more announcements. Okay, so I, I put up a reading that on the website that you were welcome to read if you wanted to. It's from one of the prize books. It says it's called it's Readings from Building a Bankroll. So it sort of goes with what I'm going to talk about this class on post law tournament and river play. Okay. So a few more things. Um, if you can subscribe or like thumbs up my YouTube videos, I I appreciate that a lot. Um, I don't plan on like making money from this, don't worry, but um, so, also this Thursday night will be your last chance to get 10 points necessary to pass the course. So, this is sort of on the other end of the scale. Um, yeah, if you don't already have 10 points, 
So you should try to start playing more tournaments now. I will be fairly lenient and let basically most people who don't have 10 points pass the course, but you should try to get in something like 15 tournaments, you know, like if you know, because like I said, on average, you're supposed to earn one point per tournament you play. So if you only play like three tournaments and you don't have 10 points, it's hard for me to pass you because, you know, you just like, like if I myself play three tournaments, I don't think the chance that I could get 10 points is that high. So, I mean like, so, you know, try to play 15 tournaments you can. Try to play at least 10 tournaments. If you play at least 10 tournaments and write a report, then I'll pass you. If you play less than 10 tournaments and don't have 10 points, then um, things will be a bit iffy. But, like, there's six tournaments a day. There's going to be even more than six tournaments on the last couple of days. So, you know, if you don't have 10 points yet, you really got to get playing, and it shouldn't be hard to play 10 tournaments. Really, I hope it's not a high-stress situation for people, but I really want you to get some games in. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Are there any questions about this administrative stuff with prizes or like passing? Or... Uh, yeah. Uh, what happens if you are my friend? Oh, okay. Uh, we'll have to, we'll explain that. Okay, so like, if we one of us wins, the person who comes second knocks us out, and like, if I knock Mike out, then the person who knocks me out gets like both coaches. So okay, that'll be. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay, so in this class, I'm going to give more examples on post flop play, especially tournament and group play. So before we mostly only covered like how to play draws, what I talked about in fly dot, and like I, I remember there was a day where I gave examples of when you can get all the money in the flop. So tournament and river play happen less frequently than flop play because often you're going to get a ball in the flop or all in by the flop, so you're not going to be playing the tournament number that frequently. But the thing is, when you do, the pots will be bigger, right? Because the pots grow exponentially. So the pots will be bigger, which means even though you don't play turns and numbers that frequently, so um, mistakes on the turn number are more costly. You make up for the fact that you don't get there as frequently because the bets are bigger, because the pot is bigger. So all the examples today we'll be using a six-handed cash game instead of a tournament setting. So the reason we do this is because in cash games, players will have at least 100 big lines usually, which means there's more opportunity to get to tournament over play. Whereas in tournaments, when you only have 20 big lines, often you're going to be all in pre-flop or on the flop. So it's there's it's less likely that you'll get to a tournament over your decision. So, just for a change, but overall it's still the same, like right? It's still you're trying to maximize your money or maximize your chips. The principles are still the same, just the setting will look slightly different. So the setting will look something like this. So the blinds, instead of being like 50, 100 or something, they'll be one, two. And instead of chips, these will be like real dollars. And people usually have like two hundred dollars, so a hundred big blinds. So okay, so let's just so this class I'm not gonna have that many examples. There's gonna be lots of theory. As a contrast to the last class, where there was practically no theory. But um, okay, so let's just look at a hand first. So this is a standard bet, bet, bet for value hand where you can bet. So we get ace king under the gun, six handed. So it's under the gun is the same as hijack minus one in this case, right? Because there's four players into the button. So we raise with ace king, and both coins come. Off. So they both check to us, and we obviously hit a good flop. So we bet, we bet 13, and the small blind calls, and the big blind folds. Okay, so the turn puts three clubs out there, and the small blind checks, and we bet 30, we bet $30 into $44 in this case. Okay, so now we're gonna stop and discuss the hand. So, one thing is, remember how I used to say bet half pot? I said in tournaments, bet half pot. But in this case, in both scenarios, we get more than half the pot. We bet 13 into 18 on the flop, and 30 into 44 on the turn. So the bet half pot rule, I think I said this before too, but I just want to emphasize it again, is it's only good if we're shallow enough, or we have few enough big blinds, such that we can get all the money in by the river without having to bet more than five. 
So if you only start the hand with 40 big blinds, you can probably do this by betting half pot, betting half pot. And on the river, you're only going to have half the pot, and you're going to get all the money. But in this case, it's not true, right? The pot, if we only bet half pot, half pot, half pot, so let's see, so if it starts 18, we bet 9, and then the pot will be 36, then we bet 18, then the pot will be 72, then we bet 36. So like, that's only going to be about like 60 or something. And we have a total of $200. So usually in cash games, when players bet, you're betting more than half the pot. You're usually betting somewhere like three quarters of the pot, something like that, because because you want to blow the pot, you want to win more money, you want the pot to be more significant, basically. So, so usually you want to bet bigger. Okay, so the second issue with is, are we afraid of a flush when we bet the turn? So, so the answer is yes, he could have a flush, but there's a good chance he would raise the flush draw on the flop, so this reduces the chances somewhat. So, nonetheless, my plan is to bet here and fold to a raise. So, whenever you bet, you should always ask yourself what I'm going to do if you get raised. You should always have a plan in mind when you bet of well, how you're going to react to potential raises. Especially in cases where you're in position. So, like, if you check, you would have seen a river card for free, right? So, so if you're going to bet, you make yourself susceptible to getting raised. So you should definitely have a plan for how you're going to react to a raise. So, in this case, uh, so there's a, there's a few principles that that are good to play by. Um, so you shouldn't put all your money in in a singly raised pot with one pair. What I mean by singly raised pot is a pot where just one person raised and people call. So like you raised the six dollars here and he called. It wasn't a re-raised pay pot. Usually you shouldn't be putting all your money in post flop with one pair in that case. So like you don't want to put in three big blinds pre flop and ninety-seven big blinds post flop with one pair. And the second point is getting raised on the turn or river is a lot scarier than getting raised on the flop. Because on the flop lots of speculative hands or like weak draws can still be raising you just to like test the waters, just to see what's going on. But on the turn or river with fewer cards left to come, people are less likely to have a speculative hand and more likely to have a real hand. And the third principle is sort of don't call a turn raise when you could be drawing dead, which in this case we could be, right? Because we only have one pair. So if he has a flush, we're drawing dead. If he has pocket fours, we're drawing dead. If he has three, five, a straight, we're drawing dead. So, so those are some, some principles to remember. They're kind of general, but um, I just wanted to emphasize that we should have a plan when we're weak back. Okay, so anyways, he calls, he calls the turn. So fortunately, he doesn't raise, he just calls, which leads us to believe that we have the best hand, and we should continue value betting on the river. Right, so value betting means betting where you're hoping the other guy calls you with the weak. So the third club is actually not a bad card for us in some cases, because it forces him to put in more money with one pair plus club hands. So, like if he has eight pocket eights with the eight of clubs, or like pocket tens with the ten of clubs, he probably can't fold this turn, because you know he, he has a decent pair and he has a flush draw. Whereas if he, had, if he had pocket eights and the turn was the nine of hearts, then there's a good chance he would fold because there's two cards higher than one. So, right, and if, if a fourth club comes in the river, so when we bet, we should also sort of have a river plan. So, most likely we're going to be betting on the river again because we have a, the highest pair with the highest possible card to go with it, which is called the kicker, the highest possible kicker. But if a fourth club comes in the river, we shouldn't be putting in any more money. So, okay, so the river is the two of diamonds, and he checks and we bet again. And he calls and he has ace jack with ace of clubs. So the summary is, so we extracted a lot of value from one pair by betting on all streets and betting big, right? If we bet small, we wouldn't have won this much money from ace jack on this board. This is why it's important to bet big. We won a lot more because we bet more than half the pot. So betting somewhere like three quarters of the pot is decent when you have 100 big blinds. And 
I think our opponent's play is pretty good. Um, I mean, maybe he could have folded the river, but I think he mostly just got caught lucky. So it's always good to also put yourself in your opponent's shoes each hand and see, you know, would I have played the hand the same as him if I was him? And he's definitely not folding the turn with the ace of clubs, where he can, can, has, can hit the best possible flush. So, so I think his play is fine. Um, and I think in this situation, the worst hand I would have done this with is maybe ace queen. With ace jack, if I bet the river, I don't think he's going to call me with the worst hand that frequently, so I probably would have just checked the river or like checked the turn and bet the river or something. So, another important thing to keep in mind is if I base from the button instead of under the gun, then I probably would bet ace jack. So I said in this situation, I wouldn't bet ace jack for value because I don't think he's calling the worst hand that frequently. But if I was raising, if I raise from the button and he's safe off in the big blind, then maybe ace jack is okay because my range is a lot weaker when I open from the button. And I have a lot more bad hands in my range, which means a hand like ace jack that's pretty good is relatively strong. But when I raise from under the gun, since I have so many good hands in my range, ace jack relatively is weaker, which means he's not going to call me that frequently. So, Okay, so the important thing to sort of figure out when you have a lot of bets post flop is, so usually in tournaments, you, you're either getting the money all in post flop or you're not getting the money all in post flop, right? So that's usually the only decision you have to make in, in tournaments because you usually don't have that many big blinds. But when you have a lot of big blinds, like when you have 100 big blinds or more, 200 big blinds, you're basically never gonna hit a board unless you hit like a full house or better. You're not going to have a board where you want to put all 200 big blinds in post flop. So it's good to always have a sense of how many big blinds you're willing to put in post flop before you fold. Because almost always the answer is never going to be all of your money. It's, it's very hard to get a hand where you're willing to put in all of your money in post flop. So as you can see in this case, is, in this case we put in about we put in about $120. We, so the way you sort of think. The way you usually think about it is how many ten times am I betting? Am I, is my hand good enough to bet the flop, bet the turn, and bet the river? Or is it good enough to only bet the flop and bet the turn? Or equivalently bet the flop and bet the river? Or like, is my hand only good enough to bet once? So a general rule of thumb is uh, the, the best possible one pair of hand is usually you can bet three times for value, but only the best possible one pair of hand. So, like I said in this case, if I had ace jack, I probably wouldn't have done this three times unless I thought my opponent was going to call me with a very weak hand. Okay, so let's look at a similar hand where I have ace 10 under the gun here, and I raise. And this is probably the weakest offsuit ace I raise, by the way, so I probably wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're getting exceptionally good odds, but it would be really close. Um, it, it would basically come down to a read, I think. I think it would come down to a read. So, like, you would be getting exceptionally good odds, right? Because you bet 70 and he would only raise to 151. So, it would, um, the thing is, it doesn't make sense for him to have that many strong hands in this case, I would say, because I think. Like I don't, I think his play is almost thin with the with the flush because like full house is beautiful. So so like even if he had a flush, I don't know if he would be doing this with the hopes of me calling with a weaker game. So I think if he's gonna go all in, he either has a bluff, which is not that likely, or he's gonna have an exceptionally strong hand like pocket pulls, like he's gotta have a full house or something. So I probably fold if I in general I usually fold to a river raise because I don't think people bluff that much. So I but basically you're only you're only beating a bluff for sure. But it doesn't make sense for him to have that many good hands in this range because I don't think he's gonna play a flush like this. <coughs> I think he would like raise the turn with the flush. Because on the river his he his he's not that comfortable with the flush on the river, so okay. So so yes that was that was pretty in-depth analysis. So this hand I'm gonna try to through a lot of hypotheticals and there won't be as many examples. So 
it'll be less exciting than hopefully education all. Okay, so um, we base it HTML, obviously small one can also be one fold. Okay, and the flop is ace of diamonds, nine of clubs, eight of clubs. So it's a similar situation, except for the only difference is our hand is a lot weaker because we only have ace 10. And the flop is a bit scarier because instead of it being the two four clubs, it's the nine eight of clubs. So, okay, so we're going to check here. We're, so, uh, I decided to check here. Okay, so why do we check? So, I think betting is not terrible, but checking is good for a few reasons. So, I don't think betting is a terrible thing. But the, the difference here is, first of all, our hand is not good enough to bet, bet the flop, bet the turn, bet the river, right? Remember what I said. I said only if you have the best possible hand pre flop, best possible one pair hand pre flop, you can bet. So usually that's a good rule of thumb. So usually you need either the best possible one pair hand, so you know either ace king on an ace high board or pocket aces or pocket aces on like a jack high board or like ace jack on a jack high board. Um, so usually you need a hand that's either two pair or better or the best possible one pair hand. You bet three times. So with a, with a hand like ace ten, unless we hit a ten or hit a second ace or something, we probably can't bet three times for value. So, so with ace king, the reason why we have to bet the flop is because our hand is good enough to bet three times for value. So if we check the flop, then we missed an opportunity to bet, right? Then we can't bet three times. But with ace 10, it's okay, because we can check the flop and still bet the turn and bet the river. So that's one reason why checking is okay. Second reason is there's a lot more draws in his range this time, so like jack 10 or even queen 10, whereas before when it was ace 2-4, you know, people aren't going to follow 5-6 or 5-7 or whatever that figure like. So there's a lot more draws in his range this time, like clubs, jack 10, 10-7, 10, even like queen 10, a 4 out straight draw could do something funny and check raise us as a club. And we have to fold do a raise because, you know, not only is he check raising with bluffs, he's also going to have good hands when he check raises. He's going to have two pairs, he's going to have pocket eights, pocket nines, the occasional ace king that, occasionally he'll have, he'll have ace king, but not that frequently, because I expect him to re-raise ace king three fall. And the third reason for, the th third reason for betting is, uh, sorry, the third reason for checking is, there's not like a higher card that can come on the turn, because we already hit a pair of aces. So if the fault was 10, 9, 8, then betting would seem a lot more reasonable because if the flop was 10, 9, 8, like the turn can be a jack, a queen, a king, or a, uh, a jack, a queen, or a king, and the, all three of those cards aren't good for you. But when it's ace, 9, 8, that's not the case. So when you have a when you have something like ace, 10, there's a di big difference between the flop coming 10, 5, 2, and the ace, 5, 2. There's a difference between hitting the 10 and hitting the ace. In both cases, you have a good Hand, but when, when the high card is the 10, then your hand is vulnerable. A jack king or a queen can come and move in your hand, whereas if the high card is the ace, you're a lot less vulnerable. Although, you're more likely to be beat because he can have ace jack or ace queen. Whereas, if the flop came 10 5 2, you only use the pocket jacks, and there's fewer combinations. Okay, so we check. I think betting is okay, by the way. I think betting is fine, but I think checking is slightly better. And he bets the turn, and we call. So the turn was fairly good for us, and we could consider raising to charge draws and we'll see the river. So once again, I, I call here, but I think raising is okay because there's lots of draws, there's clubs, there's diamonds, and there's lots of straight draws that you know we want to price them, we want to make them pay more to see the river. So, calling is decent. Sorry, sorry. So raising is decent because we we charge them more to see the river. But I think for every time you charge a draw successfully to see the river, you also risk putting in more money when you're losing. Like there's no reason he can have, he doesn't have ace eight here, right? Because like if he had ace eight, it's not like his play is consistent with his line. Like if he had ace eight, he's not gonna beat the flop. He would. 
he would often still chat the clock to us because we were the new clock raiser. So it definitely makes sense when we have PC here and or like poppy dates or something really good. So and you know by calling we can still bet the river if he checks. So we're not really losing a bet. We can still bet the river if he checks or like call a safe river if he bets. So we can still get more money in on the river and that's fine because we only wanted to get in two streets anyway. So usually Usually when you say back to flop, back to turn, back to river, that means three streets. If you're only like betting twice, it means two streets. So with a hand like this, we for our goals, they only get in two streets. So there's no need to raise now because we can bet later and still get in two streets. So yeah. You said that you could always check to the free club racer, at least on the beginning. And in this case, you check as a free club racer and then the other guy uh, race. Okay. Yeah. How hard does the, this work after after the free free flop uh, racer checks uh, uh, we should build the whole other team or, or we should just race or, or what's what's the problem? Oh, um okay, so I think before I said usually it's standard to check to the free flop racer because the free flop racer can have really good hands in this range, like pocket aces, whereas the free flop caller can't. So um, but after the free flop racer checks behind, then then like anything can go on the turn. There's, there's no reason you gotta check him again because he would have bet pocket aces properly or whatever. So there's no so like you know if if, if the small blind has a good hand on this turn, he's gotta bet it because he, he can't afford to check again and miss another opportunity to put money in. But you, the reason why you check on the flop usually is because they're like you can bet on the flop anyway, so you can usually just check and raise them. Uh, and during the turn, we should also check the free flop racer if you race after the flop, or, or, or it's also whatever you want to do? Um, it's sort of whatever you want to do, but often checking is still good. Like um, like the first hand that I talked about, this ace king hand, where we had an ace king and we got the flop. And if he had a flush here, I think he, checking to us is really good because it's likely we'll bet again and then he can check raise us. So usually, like checking is still fine if they bet the flop, but it, but it, yeah. So like it's hard. It's, it's hard to answer it generally. It really depends. Okay. So right. So we call here, and so he bets twenty on the river, and the river is kind of dangerous. The river completes diamonds. It, it gives diamonds a flush. It gives jack ten a straight. He bets, but we still call. So the river isn't great for us, but you know he could be bluffing like missed clubs, or he could be he could be value betting ace x. So he could be value betting an ace with a small card, right? a hand that's worse than us. So right. So when you analyze your opponent's bet, you shouldn't put them on random hands. Remember, the purpose of every bet is either a bluff or a value bet, which means which means a bluff means he's trying to get you to fold a better hand. Or a value that means he's trying to get you to call a worse hand. So every bluff is one or the other. So when you're analyzing your opponent's bet and figuring out what he could have, you should figure out whether he could he's bluffing or he's value betting. So the reason I call is because he could be bluffing, which means I, I always beat him because he's not going to bluff a hand that's better than ace ten. But even more, there's some chance he's value betting, like ace ace six. Like you could he can have ace six here and think that his hand is good and be betting and hoping he calls a queen or a nine or something. So I definitely call here and so notice here it's also important on boards like this to recognize when your kicker plays. So in this case my best five card hand is ace ace queen ten nine. Right? So I actually beat ace deuce ace deuce. But if I had like ace seven here, then I would, I might, I would probably still call, but I would be a lot less happy about it because if I had ace seven, I tie ace two, right? Because ace two also has ace ace queen nine eight as their best five card hand, and ace seven also has ace ace queen nine eight as their best five card hand. So, so it is important to pay attention to whether your kicker, which is your non ace card, whether it's relevant. But anyway, so we call. And we do win. We do win that pot against 10 seven of clubs. So, so imagine what would have happened if we bet the flop. If we bet the flop, he definitely would have raised with his monster draw, right? With his 15 out draw. And 
and we probably would have folded, and we wouldn't have won the product. He would have won the product. This was a really good draw. So this this sort of shows one advantage of checking. I mean, he, if he happens to have ten seven clubs, then yeah, checking is better. But this is exactly a situation where checking is good. Yeah. Hey. What size better you want to Like you bet about half time. What you bet like the pot a little over there? Um, if you bet the pot, I would. If you bet the pot, it's a lot scarier, but I would probably still end up calling. Mm -hmm. But if you bet the pot, I would probably call like e seven, I'd say. Yeah, but um, usually trying to read too much into bet sizing is, uh, I usually don't advise it that much. I usually think just treat a bet as a bet unless the bet is, you know, especially small. Like if the bet is like a third of the pot, then you can treat it differently. Or if the pet bet is like, like more than the pot, you can treat it differently. But usually treating bets from three quarters pot to the pot size is one size is fine. Um, yeah, it's a bit more complicated, but it, like it, that's not a great general rule. But it's hard for me to get into it without seeing that as a general rule. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, had we met the flop, our our opponent definitely would have raised for value, and so I think this hand our opponent played well. So. I think you know he going for the check raise on the flop is definitely good with his monster hand, and betting the turn is definitely a good idea for him because on the turn you know on the turn he has seven high he has ten high so he definitely wants to bluff us off a lot of hands and also he builds the pot by betting the turn for the rivers that he does hit it allows him to make a larger value bet on the river when he, if he bets the turn and the river is definitely a good bluff for him because. Remember what I said, when you have a draw and you don't hit your draw, good rivers to bluffs, good rivers to bluff are cards that complete other draws, right? So he had a he had a club draw and a straight draw of um, where he needed a jack or a six, but the queen completed not only the diamond draw, it also completed the jack ten draw. So he can he can definitely represent one of those other draws. So it's a great card for the bluff. So I think our opponent played well, and yeah. So I think both players in this hand played well. Okay. So next example. So we raise from the hijack with the pocket eights, and the button calls, and everyone else folds. Okay. And the flop is jack six five, and we do continuation bet here. So. Why do we continuation bet here? So reasons for betting. So we have we had a similar strength hand in the last hand, where we had ace ten on an ace nine eight board. I'd say pocket eights on a jack six five board is similarly strong, maybe slightly weaker. But why do we bet here instead of? But in the last case, I said checking was better. So the biggest factor is in this case more over cards could come to sort of destroy our hand. So in the ace ten case, there wasn't a card that could come that was a higher pair than the ace because the ace is the highest possible pair. But in this case, you know, a queen, a king, an ace, a ten, a nine are all like not great cards for our hand. So even though our hand is similarly strong, there's a lot more scary turns that can come. So we don't really want to get to that turn. So we bet. So also, we're out of position this time. So that's a very important thing to realize. So even if we check, we don't automatically advance to the turn, right? Another advantage of checking when you're in position, which means you're the last to act, is by checking, your opponent doesn't get to check raise you. You deny your opponent a check raising opportunity. You get to see the turn for sure. But in this case, even if we check, he can still bet because he's the button. So, so we're out of position this time. So even if we check, he can still bet, which means, so one thing about continuation betting is you should be way more likely to want a continuation bet when you're out of position. So, because when you're out of position, if you check, he can bet anyway. Whereas if you're in position, if you bet, you actually give him an opportunity to raise that he otherwise wouldn't have had if you checked. So, so yes, there are draws like 7-8 and 7-9 or diamonds here that could raise us to bet and we would have to fold our hand. But, I mean, there really is no choice. 
the first two factors are just too overwhelming. So he calls our bet. And the turn is the ten of spades. So we can't really do much on the ten of spades here. So with pocket eights, when there's two cards like this, probably, you know, so I would, uh, so probably we're definitely not, we can't, definitely can't bet 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 for money. Our, our hand's definitely not good enough to get three streets of value. But getting two streets is maybe possible if the river is really friendly, if the river is like a two. But if the river is anything higher than an eight, then even getting two streets of value is asking for too much. Just the fact that we got money in on the flop is basically enough. So at this point in the hand, our goal is basically checking and trying to see a showdown, more or less. So like our hand's not good enough that we actually want to put money in. We just want to see a showdown. Hopefully we see the showdown before we get lost off the hand. But unfortunately, we check the turn, and he bets 23 in the turn. So we just fold. So the analysis is, even though our pair of eights is not bad on this turn, the implied odds on the river are terrible. So pocket eights on this turn is, is not bad. You know, we could be beating him. And we probably have direct equity to call. But the problem is, even when we call, we still have to play the river. And lots of scary cards that can, can come in the river, right? Any spade completes a flush, any diamond completes a flush. Lots of cards, a lot of like nines, queens, kings, aces are all scary cards and we don't want to do. So, he's in position. So, you know, on the river, when we check, he can always bet. And we're gonna make lots of mistakes. You know, often if the river's a king, he can bluff like ace nine and we're gonna fold the better hand. Or like, you know, if, if even if the river is like a two, he can bet his ace jack, and we're gonna call the his hand. So we're basically just gonna make a lot of mistakes on the river. So our implied odds are terrible, so we just won't. Because the only chances we actually hit a good river is by hitting an eight, and there's only two of those. So so this signifies how important position is when you're in position. So so this is how important position is when you have a lot of big points. So in tournaments, when you got an all in preflop, position like didn't matter because you weren't playing post flop. But when you're a, when you have a hundred big points and you got to make a lot of flop decisions, turn decisions, river decisions, position is so important. So look at all the suboptimal things that that could have happened only because we were out of position. So we were forced to bet the flop basically because. By checking, he could bet anyway. So basically, we we bet we had to bet the flop because we were out of position. If we were in position, then we maybe still would bet. But betting is a lot worse. So you know, by being out of position, we're just forced to bet on the flop often. And oops. and also, our opponent can raise the flop with a lot of weak draws, and we have to fold an overwhelming majority of the time. And on the turn, we basically had to fold through his bet because we were out of position, right? If we were in position this hand, he might have checked the turn to us because he thought, oh, he might go for the check raise on the turn. He might think that we were going to bet the turn. So if we were in position, he might have checked the turn, and then we could have checked the turn, and then we would have seen the river for free. But because we were out of position, after we checked, he, he saw that we checked so that he could bet, and then we folded. So he, he won the pot a lot. He basically won the pot because of position. We lost the pot because we were out of position. He got to turn after he saw that we checked, and we have no choice but to fold because, you know, even if we call, we have to also play the river out of position. So position is exceptionally important when you have 100 big blinds because you just get to make better decisions on the flop, on the turn, on the river, which is very important when most of the money is going to go in on the turn and on the river. Okay, so the next hand, um, I think, okay, so I'm going to take a break here, because, yeah, I'm going to take a break here, I'll start again in 